what is spirit? What is spirituality? There will be diversity amongst us, all of us, in answers to these questions. But at the outset, I want to say this. I approach the subject of uh, spirituality and healing with a whole person focus. In a whole person focus, body, mind, and spirit are humanly constructed descriptive terms for rich, indivisible dimensions of lived, real world experience. The anchoring point for this discussion tonight is healing relationship, or perhaps one could say relational spirituality. And hopefully the story or stories I offer tonight will capture and honour these dimensions, though I guess you will all pick them up in different ways. Stories have long been fundamental to human functioning, and this room is seething with stories, and stories within stories. And tonight I will present the story of a woman I shall call C, with her consent, actually. C presented to me some 20 years ago with a mouth like this. A condition called leukoplakia, which is a, a serious precancerous condition of the mouth. And as I'll tell you later, she had had seven episodes of mouth cancer with reconstructive surgery. I've already written about her in my first book, Somatic Illness and the Patient's Other Story, published in 1997. So recently I contacted her again to ask her permission to use her story to tell my story. The story of what goes on within me as I work with people in a healing capacity. Stories within stories. C is in her late 70s, and I first met her some 25 years ago, and she's in good health. She has read this talk and is happy for me to include her story without modification. She has given her own moving version of the story um, at this site. So you can check up on me there. My intention is to provide you a view of the inside of a whole person-centered clinical approach. But I ask you to keep in mind that the whole person approach is always unique to the clinical situation because each person, each patient, each client, each clinician is unique. Moreover, this kind of care can be very complex or very simple, enacted over long periods of time or enacted very briefly. So this particular story should not be seen as a template exactly fitting your story. There are two principal requirements in whole person healthcare as we see it. Firstly, the clinician must have a view of the person as a unified whole which is no minor issue. Given the dualistic state of modern healthcare or the dualistic framework of Western thinking. And what I mean by that, in, uh, by the dualistic state of modern healthcare, the division of the person into body, mind, spirit, or whatever other dimensions you think make up the human uh, being and a human being's functioning. So the first thing is, if you don't have a concept of the person as a unified whole, you cannot treat a person as a whole. The second thing is the clinician must have some skills in allowing relevant aspects of the whole into the clinical space. Again, no minor issue, because we are trained to divide the person and to exclude important elements from our fields of view. 
Finally, in this little introduction, in telling C's story tonight, I am not saying that this would be the way another whole person-centered clinician would do it. What I am reflecting on is some of the principles, values, and assumptions um, of a whole person approach. But where to begin? I was aged about eight or nine in the days, which some will remember, in our modest post-war household, we as children had a proper bath once per week. In our case, each Saturday. After my father had laboriously boiled up the copper and then fetched buckets of boiling water to the bathroom, I assume that was to save electricity. But the day I have in mind was not a Saturday, but a weekday. And bedtime washing space was at a premium in our very small house containing then four and later five active boys. On this particular day, I had scored the kitchen sink for this task. <laughs> now this isn't me, because <laughs> we didn't have color photography in those days. Um, I was older than this on this particular day. I was about eight or nine. Um, and I wasn't sitting in the sink. I had my muddy legs. I was sitting on the edge and my muddy legs were in the sink. Just to get the details right. My mother was sewing again at the kitchen table. Inexplicably, I turned to her and declared I was going to become a doctor. And she said something like, oh yes, and that seemed to be that. There was no precedent for university or medical education in our immediate or extended family. I have no recall of any relevant thought process preceding this formal announcement. I had been taken to the GP perhaps two or three times for minor abdominal pain in the preceding years, so I was a little bit familiar with doctors. And our GP, uh, Dr. Milligan, practiced, of course, out of Harley Buildings in Cambridge Terrace, Christchurch. And those of you who are old enough will know about Harley Street. Yes, there's quite a few. Um, Harley Buildings. There's Harley Buildings, and as done up after the earthquake. Harley build, this Harley building was a darkly panelled, wide staircased, oppressively quiet building, harbouring a host of medical and dental activities and secrets. I do recall that on one of those occasions, Dr Milligan asked me for a urine sample. I obliged, and he disappeared into his side room, leaving me and my mother sitting silently in the office. And I think it was this room here, because we were looking out onto that street. Eventually, he reappeared with a tiny flask full of fluid, and without explanation, asked me to drink it. <laughs> Caught in a bewildering ferment of suspicion and necessary compliance, I did so. It wasn't so bad. Of course, later I understood that he was alkalinizing my urine with potassium citrate. But I do have to wonder about the power and authority elements. I also recall my mother's painful, cracked and bleeding fingers. She had lost her own mother to cancer when she was age 16 and took over her father's household for the next five years. And this included the mothering of three younger siblings. Much later, in a rare disclosure, she told me it was during those years she developed the very severe hand dermatitis, causing the cracking that I had observed, a most difficult condition for a woman with a large family in an era of hand-washed laundry. Whatever the influences, my conscious sense of medical vocation began on that day at the kitchen sink 
in the presence of my mother, and it grew, and it has persisted for decades. I've now been occupied with medicine, healing and health care for the 51 years since my graduation from medical school. For 47 years of, the, of those years, I've been a specialist physician in clinical immunology. But in 1972, I reached a crisis in my academic and clinical career trajectory because immunology seemed to be focusing me into an excessive technological and laboratory focus on the bodies of patients. The urge within me to explore and understand other dimensions of human reality in my medicine had become something I could not ignore. Having neither the time nor the requisite skills to address whole person aspects of my patients, I threw over my burgeoning career in immunology to train in psychiatry as a pragmatic and frankly remunerated way of beginning some kind of grappling with this urge. But uh, psychiatry proved to be a way station, not sufficient for purpose. I diverged further and trained as a psychotherapist. And for the last 31 years, I've integrated clinical immunology, internal medicine, and psychotherapy perspectives in my treatments of patients presenting with physical illnesses. Collateral to all this, elements of Christian spirituality have surrounded and permeated this integrative journey. And in turn, that spirituality has been profoundly modified, influenced, and shaped by some of the extraordinary things that I've seen and experienced as I gradually opened up myself to whole persons rather than just to diagnoses or diseases. The challenges of focusing on whole persons and healing rather than on bits of persons are substantial because the endeavor is medically countercultural. So what has it been like? Well, it's been like moving down a river. I really don't know how the symbol of my integrative journey emerged, but it has been with me for decades. In this river there was, is, always the prospect of moving further downstream and a drive to do so. Sometimes I have flowed with the current. Not easily, but at least going somewhere. Sometimes, or not infrequently, I've stranded myself on a sandbank and found it difficult to get unstuck. For longish periods, I've secured myself beside a comfortable bank under nicely shading trees with a green clearing, and despite growing frustration, have resisted untying the craft and moving on. At other times, I have suspended caution, slipped somewhat recklessly downstream with the current, found myself in white water and in danger of tipping out. But despite the temptation to settle into less than satisfactory places, there Always there was and is the next bend, the allure, the excitement, the hope, the fascination with what is around the corner, a certainty that there is much more to see and worth reaching. And this conviction comes from here and from here. This river symbolism conveys more about me than describing myself as a doctor or a psychotherapist or a professional. Though these roles are very, very important to my functioning, I actually see myself and my responsibilities in the world primarily as a healer. I do not mean healer in that scornful Western pejorative sense, oh, she went to see some kind of healer. What does it mean to heal? If we are serious about grasping healing in its rich variety of forms and range of possibilities, there are so many things to consider. 
and to hold in consciousness. One of the reasons many of us confine ourselves in enclosures which address only limited aspects of healing reality is that we get lost and discomforted if we wander outside these comfortable enclosures. We find we have no language for the mysteries we encounter. We fear the unknown. We fear loss of mastery and competence. The adventurous London philosopher Jules Evans, in his book, The Art of Losing Control, a philosopher's search for ecstatic experience, likens this enclosure comfort to dwelling in a rickety shed in a haunted forest. He is saying that one way or another we all construct rickety sheds to live in. They're practical and give us a sense of coherence They serve to protect us from uncertainty, scary unknowns, mystery, and sadly, the numinous. But in addition, they wall us off from possibility. After training in psychiatry and psychotherapy and resuming immunology practice, I became aware of the role of patient stories and the symbolic in physical disease, and you'll see a bit more of that in a moment. And it was this that collapsed what was left of my tidy biomedical enclosure. And to enlarge on that, I want to return to C's story. But before I do so, I need to say this. I have discovered many diverse, interesting, and important resources available for building not-so-rickety sheds. We all need a shed, but some of them are more rickety than others and smaller, less capacious, and more shut off, and less windows, and less doors. Sheds that will enable, indeed, compel whole person-centered care. These resources have included on the body side, apart from ordinary medical knowledge, theories of emotional expression and embodiment, the large and, and largely ignored literature in psychoneuroimmunology the traditional and somewhat misleading literature in psychosomatics, and the studies showing the influence of emotional, physical, and sexual trauma uh, towards future bodily illness. On the philosophy side, it has been necessary to consider consciousness, the nature of subjectivity and experience, and to develop a meaningful concept of personhood. What on earth is a person? The notions of complexity and emergence and co-emergence of mind and body or co-emergence of subjectivity and physicality have been crucial. Many clinical experiences have taken me sometimes very uncomfortably well beyond the confines of physico-materialist narratives of reality. On the psychological side, I've been influenced by psychodynamic theory, self-psychology, relational psychoanalysis, Sullivanian psychoanalysis, object relations theory, and behavioral theory. I'm saying those things fast to get them out of the way. Perhaps most importantly, my clinical experience has convinced me that relationships and love, the lack of love, the distortions of love, are crucial elements in disease formation and in healing processes. But let's now move away from intellectual description and return to C. C was a professional person, aged 52. She appeared in my Christchurch clinic some 25 years ago. She was recommended to consult with me by her supervisor, who was apparently conversant with my approach to physical illness, as it was then. Specifically, she wanted help with her mouth condition, this precancerous disorder called leukoplakia. It had been a problem for over 20 years. She had had seven operations for cancer of the mouth and tongue, one procedure so serious that it required two years of retraining for her to be able to talk. I was taken aback. I had never actually seen leukoplakia or even mouth cancer in the flesh. I don't treat cancer. It's not within my professional scope. 
In any conventional view, she was in the wrong place. I was not the right person. These were things going on in my head as I uh, met with her. I had then and have since treated very diverse physical conditions from a whole person perspective, but cancer seemed a bridge too far. The scopes of healing endeavours are heavily prescribed and proscribed. Over the last 120 years, we have developed elaborate institutionalised systems for ascertaining and defining competence. Healing activities are recognised, condoned, funded, regulated, and at times punished. Boundaries between disciplines are formalised, trainings are structured and certified, evidence is assessed hierarchically, notions of best practice and guidelines have proliferated. Much of this is practical, understandable and necessary. Human behaviour does need regulation. But all of this is determined by visible and invisible forces. The most important of these is the physico-materialist dualist, reductionist paradigm of reality under by, underpinning biomedicine, in which physicality or body always trumps subjectivity or mind and spirit. With C there in front of me, I felt the weight of all this orthodoxy upon me. And yet I remember thinking, feeling, knowing, without knowing, that there must be some reason she was there on that occasion on that day in my office. Over the years, I had appreciated that despite my fears of the unknown, which were considerable, if I opened spaces, or rather let the spaces open, things would start to emerge, things that were normally silenced or rendered invisible by the weighty prescriptive algorithmic enclosures of normative healthcare practice. It had become a conviction, actually, that given a proper chance, other kinds of relevant truth would often emerge in one way or another. So what did I do? I simply asked her what she was hoping for from me. Harry Stack Sullivan, once the head of the Sullivanian Institute for Interpersonal Psychoanalysis in New York, once said, If we have the wit to see it, the truth is all there in the first session. I believe this to be true. In some way, the truth surfaces in some form the moment we meet. This was C's reply. Last night, I said to my husband, if only I could get rid of it, I would have peace of mind. Of course, the meaning of this is obvious. Not one of us would doubt the sinister impact of this nasty precancerous condition and on top of that repeated cancerous episodes upon peace of mind. And likely our minds would swerve instantly to the magnificent potentials and successes of the diagnostic technological world of the physician to the facio maxillary surgeons and oncologists down the road. After all, she is still alive after 25 years. But there was something about that word, it, that caught me. Of course, it was the cancer. But there was something about the way she said it, or perhaps it was simply the circumstances of our meeting that led me to wonder whether there was another level to it. Was it a surface marker, a sign, a symbol, for something deeper, yes, still something physical, and yet something else. Is there a story here? I didn't know. How could a word like it, so short, so mundane, have any potential? Was this a Harry Stack Sullivan moment? If we have the wit to see it, it is all there in the first session. Maybe here even in the first sentence. Or is it a Paul Ricoeur moment? Is it an always already moment, popularized by Ricoeur, but utilized by Zoroaster, Nietzsche, Marx, and Heidegger? 
What we're looking for is always already there. But in the it, in the Luca Plaque here itself, I accept that these could be dangerous notions to popularize, especially for those inclined to hurry, to impulsivity, and with ego needs to be clever and right. There's no room in this kind of care for hubris, for grandiosity, for presumption, for narcissistic clinical endeavor. And after all, it is cancer of the tongue and there are oncologists down the road. I kept listening. I asked her to tell me her story. But where actually do stories start? In 1987, I commenced a combined practice of immunology and psychotherapy at the Arahura Center in Christchurch. And wearing these professional hats simultaneously, I started to hear and see patient stories and patterns that would radically change my clinical life and broaden my management of people with physical conditions. Stories embrace the past, the present, and they tend to configure the future. Daniel Mendelssohn, who's seen here with his father, actually, an American classicist, essayist, and literary critic, in his extraordinary memoir, An Odyssey, which is partly built around one of the most famous stories of Western culture, Homer's mythic epic poem of journey, The Odyssey. Mendelssohn points out that the ancient Greek way of telling stories is by ring composition. That is, the story spiral and loop around the arche kakoi, the beginning of bad things, the point from which the story started and to which we keep returning. Ring composition in stories is a way of embracing the past, the present, and sometimes even the future. And the stories I was hearing from my patients were exactly like this. Before I knew about ring composition, I used to refer to the echoes I was hearing within each story I was listening to. And so here's my point in the words of Mendelssohn. In this way, a single narrative, even a single moment, and I will add, a single physical disorder, or maybe a single word, can contain a character's entire biography. Start anywhere and the ring structure means you'll get to the core of the story. I have in the past told people consulting me not to worry, we can start anywhere, which is quite discombobulating for a patient. Flippantly, I have said, though I don't seem to say it so often now, even if we start burrowing under the big toenail, we will eventually reach the heart. <laughs> that is if you believe in the heart and persist. I suggested to see that we could start from the beginning, and so she did. She told me, and this is how she started, she told me that her parents were very unhappily married, and in an attempt to make the relationship work, they conceived a child, C. It was said that on the day the father dropped C and her mother home from the maternity hospital, he went off to see his mistress. He was serially unfaithful. At around C's age five to six, her father died whilst away from home, though she was not told the cause of death. At age 12, she was found weeping in her bedroom by her mother, who by this time was alcoholic. Asked why she was weeping, C said she was crying, I quote, about daddy. Whereupon, her mother went out of the room, and as she did so, she inexplicably threw out the comment, quotes, if you had sat on his knee, he wouldn't have died. At age 16, an uncle told her of her father's suicide. At age 19, she married a man like her father, and some years later, after having two children, divorced him because of infidelity. Back to the river. Thus far, C and I had moved steadily downstream without serious obstruction. It was a vivid story with intense nodal points. 
The mother's not knee sitting comment was shocking. Nevertheless, perhaps 30 to 40 minutes into the session, it seemed we had plenty of story, but somehow we weren't there. I was running out of puff. I was losing my sense of direction. And after all, she'd come about her mouth condition. And here I was focusing on other stuff. Stories may have a ring structure, but within such structures, there are nodes of activity or junctures or escalation points which become new beginnings. The beginnings I tend to focus on are the original beginnings of symptoms or the more recent occasions when the symptoms get worse again. And as some of those who know me well here, I typically use, well, no, I typically use my smorgasbord question, which quickly goes like this. About the time your symptoms began or when they got worse recently, what was the most interesting, memorable, significant, difficult, relevant, hard, problematic, frustrating, worrying, stressful thing or things that happened in your life? <laughs> That's what you call an open question. <laughs> I say it more gently than that, but, I, um, but you're not patient, so I can do it um, <laughs> that way. On this, but on this occasion, I asked her, when did your leukoplakia begin? Oh, I know when that was. I was 33. I felt something in her way of saying this. I might expect people to say, oh, my early 30s, I think. But knowing exactly when it was? Recently, I saw a person recently with uh, chronic urticaria. Some of you will have suffered this. I asked her when it began. She also knew exactly. It was 9.30 p.m. at night after her daughter's 15th birthday was over and she had sat down for a rest. Oh well, some might say you would remember that. But if we stop the process of exploration right there, we would miss whole layers of reality. Behind that birthday was a week of insomnia, of overreaching capacity to put on an extraordinary and unnecessarily magnificent event for her daughter as compensation for her own deprivation as a child. By the end, we all knew, she, her husband and I, exactly what had triggered the event. And it turned out that they knew all the time but they needed me to recognize and validate that. So let's go back to C in the age of 33. I said to her, is there something important about that? She said, I have often wondered. What have you wondered? It was the age my father died. She develops her sinister mouth condition at the very age her father died of suicide. What do you imagine the father's occupation was? He was a dentist. I remember clearly the shivers down my spine and the goosebumps. Here right in front of me was the deep connectedness of things, a loveless marriage, a tragic endeavor to fix the relationship by a conception, the adulterous affairs, the unexplained death of the father when Christina was age six, the extraordinary and harmful comment of the alcoholic mother the father as a dentist, the child as a repository of this cumulative pain, the symbolically powerful representation in the mouth, the pre-cancer beginning at the age of her father's death, and the seriousness of the cancer itself, reflecting the seriousness of the story. Maybe, in this case. Mendelssohn's Arche Kakoi, the beginning of bad things, the point from which the story started and to which we keep returning. But what to do? What would you do? This was new territory. This was cancer. I was coming around a new bend in my river, absolutely not knowing what was next. But I did feel held by my psychotherapy experience. In a sense, good psychotherapy is constituted by never knowing what to do next. By my medical background, I had the comfort of knowing intimately the cultural ethos within which I was working. 
More importantly, I had had by this time quite a lot of experience of other patients with diverse physical conditions who had done well when the story was taken into account. But most of all, I had rounded the bend, a new vista appeared and there was no turning back or bailing out. And I had the it word. So I went back to it and said to her, because I hadn't commented earlier in the session about it, look, when you first began, you told me what you said to your husband last night. I know it is at one level the cancerous problem, but I wonder if you may also be referring to more than that. Can you tell me what that might be? She wept for what seemed a very long time, murmuring, I can't get at it, I can't get at it. And she talks movingly about that experience in her narrative that I gave you the URL to before. And then she said, it is the shame of having caused my father's death. So there we have it, it. What to do now? In my own silence, I tossed it around in my head. I was convinced that we had uncovered something crucial and that she, importantly, was very prepared for something. But the norms of medicine and psychotherapy were clamoring for attention and potentially interfering. There was no comforting evidence base to guide me, except the jolting symbolic qualities of the illness and, and its story, except my experience that treating people as wholes is frequently more productive than treating them as collections of bits, except that I had pursued stories in people with chronic physical conditions less intimidating than cancer with good effect, except that emotionally, relationally, and spiritually, there was no way I could justify backing out. And anyway, we'd gone round the river, bend in the river, or some might say gone round the bend, and we were flowing with the current. But we needed a break and a rest. If something was underway, I could surely trust that it would keep going somehow. So I said, I'm not sure where we're going. But if you'd like to, I'm willing to spend some sessions to explore it further. And we spent six to seven sessions fleshing out her experience in a fairly ordinary psychotherapy mode, a kind of working through, enriching our understanding of the life history material that had emerged in the first session. At a simple level, it was about opening a space, but not just that. Healing is also about the quality and authenticity of relationship. When two people meet willingly, sincerely and openly with purpose, all kinds of opportunities emerge. Trust is crucial, not just trust in professional expertise or factual knowledge or technical ability, that may be there, but a richer and large trust, basis for trust, captured by many descriptors, including good intent, confidence that there will be mutual participation, which despite the hurdles will bring forth a fruitful journey together. That cliche phrase, trusting the process, it is a cliche because it is an embodied form of hope which transpires as two people engage in a warm and loving endeavour. At the seventh session, something unexpected happened. C came in and told me about a dream. While I am ready or willing to work with dreams if presented, I don't specifically ask people to bring their dreams. And in C's case, dreams had not been mentioned in our prior discussions. I do not remember the content of the dream. But what I do remember as we, that was that as we explored it, it seemed clear that the real issue was whether she had or had not sat on her father's knee. Now from my perspective, and surely from any reasonable perspective, she must have sat on his knee. But this is her story, her truth, the truth of the lie, or rather the truth of the lie spoken by her mother, or for whatever reason. 
As the session went on in a mutual reverie, she said to me that she had actually, she actually had a hazy memory of sitting on his knee. We sat with that in silence. What should one say anyway? And there the session ended. No bell ringing, no sense of tidy closure. Most of us recognize our yearning to be effective. It is tempting to force things at such junctures, to get excited, to talk too much, start explaining things. All this hard work and here we are, we've found the pot of gold, let's pick it up and cash it in. But stories and relationships cannot be treated like convenient artifacts or objects. It was what it was. I had no idea where it was leading. The next week, she arrived back looking different. She reported that on leaving the centre, following the dream session, and going down, following that dream session, going down the Arahura Centre driveway, experiencing an, quote, enormous joy. This joy had continued all week and persisted, actually, thereafter for some weeks. More than that, she reported being able to speak in formal meetings in a way unknown for her previously, something I was unaware of. I saw her for two more somewhat spaced out sessions. After three months, she had a regular visit to her surgeon who exclaimed, what has happened to your mouth? And so there it is. She, 25 years later, is still free. Much more could or should be said, but let's see uh, where the discussion goes tonight. But in conclusion, I do not present C as a standard algorithm for healing, spiritual or otherwise, though I think there are spiritual elements pervading it but as a story about things that I believe that are crucial to whole person healing practice. Not knowing, openness, willingness to ask and listen, warm relating, trust, belief in the experience of the other, and much more. My experience with her was a gift to me as well. These things go both ways. It shifted me along, extended my range, I experienced the intense satisfaction of following the truth and yet being free of striving for a specific gratifying outcome. It felt like an enactment of grace, something given, given in the cut and thrust of harsh reality. Her joy laid in freedom danced in a space that is ordinarily crowded with words, explanation, theory, ideology, and doctrine. That joy laid in freedom enveloped physicality and subjectivity, or if you prefer the historically valued descriptors, body, mind, soul, and spirit. It is always so. There is no con division. We are not series, a series of compartments. In this view, it makes sense that when she experienced her joy and freedom, she recovered from her physical disorder. In this example. To honor that principle, I want to return to the email I received from her, conveying her consent for me to present her story. I had offered to ring her to talk the consent through. But in one paragraph that hit me, she said this, there's no need to phone me to talk it through, as I am totally happy with your request. If you did phone, I just want to catch up with an old and dear friend and talk about the cattle over the road, the horses in the paddock behind our house, the changing sky and all the birds, and our long view over water meadows to the coast and the Marlborough Sounds beyond. Those few words conveyed much to me. In healing we are freed in some way 
to look out afresh and beyond pain and suffering. And we carry with us something warm that is deeply relational, which endures over time and distance. Thank you very much. Thank you.